In case you had any doubts, God is real, obviously, right? Now, Luke and I were driving this way, and it got darker as we left the house. And so we brought up the radar and was just watching it slowly but surely. It's going to get us, right? No matter how far north we were going to go, it was going to get us. And we're just waiting for that moment of impact, right? The National Weather Service came along and they said, you know, severe winds and hail. And we're just waiting for that moment, right? Guess what the title of my lesson is tonight? Yeah, absolutely. Let's, let's wait for it. We're waiting for the Lord. Throughout the last several weeks, I've tried to look at how I perceive this life. And the way that I'm speaking of is that my wife looked at me one day and, and she said, what's the matter? And I knew what she meant because obviously I was just frustrated. I was depressed. There wasn't much drive in me. And she knew the source of that, obviously, were the things going on at work. And she said, can you take another job at work, wherever you are? And I said, well, yeah, but it would be a significant pay cut. And she goes, it'd be worth it. And she was absolutely right. But then I thought, well, you know what? Is that really the answer? For me, it was the easiest answer, right? But the other side of it was, well, you know what, Kevin, you're going to ride a wave. So just might as well enjoy the ride and just figure out how you can enjoy that wave. What I started thinking of, and again, this didn't resolve all of my challenges and problems, but obviously I, I felt like a lot of weight come off my shoulders, even though all the weight was still there from, from the work, is at the end of every day, I started thinking to myself, you know what? You made it. You made it to the end of this day, and in all said and done, it was one day closer to going home. And I don't know when that moment's going to happen. All I know is that I'm one day closer to going home. I'm one day closer to being done with that workplace. And I'm not just talking about retirement age or whatever it is. And just the toil of life in general. We're just one day closer, right? We made it. We made it through this day. We stood firm. But what the realization is, is that I'm not done yet. And again, I don't know when that moment's going to be. If the Lord decides tomorrow I wake up, then I wake up. But in the intermittent moment, I, I'm still waiting. I'm waiting on the Lord. But in that process, how am I waiting? What am I feeling? What's going on in my life? Am I just pushing through it? Am I excited about it? Am I dreading those things? Am I missing what's in front of me? And reality is I should be longing for heaven. I should be desiring to be with God. I think all too often sometimes we get caught up to everything that's going on around us. And again, it changes our emotion. It makes me feel depressed. It makes me feel sad. It makes me get angry with someone that didn't deserve the anger. Because really, the anger source came from over here, and I'm just putting it all on them. Maybe I'm not sure how to deal with those things. Maybe I haven't prayed to God for deliverance and for help. Maybe I'm trying to figure those things out all on my own. In the end, it's just bringing me down further and further. Maybe I'm forgetting to go to church. Maybe I'm forgetting to study with my brethren. Maybe I'm forgetting to ask them to pray for me and help me in any way, shape, or form. My point is, is that we're trying to endure everything all on our own. And for some reason, we don't feel like we're being successful. Because again, I am going to live from one day to the next as long as it God allows me to do so. And I don't know. And one day, I, I, I somewhat wish I knew. If I knew I had five days left, Right? <laughs> I would be so excited. Because I wouldn't worry about what the boss tells me I have to do next week. That's seven days away. I ain't going to be there. You figure somebody else out to do it, right? If I knew I had 30 years left, what would I do? <laughs> 30 years. I feel like I'm in prison, right? 30 years to go. But every day should be lit as if it's our last, right? Yeah. Absolutely. We say that sometimes, but in reality, again, we get caught up with everything going around us. We, we forget that. You know me very well. I like the Psalms. Psalm 130 was read at our congregation this past week, and it hit me pretty hard to think about it. In Psalm 130, he says in verse 1 and 2, he says, Out of the depths I have cried to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. 
Now, there are only eight verses to this psalm, and I'm going to do my best to be very short tonight. Uh, I do apologize for the lengthy lesson this morning. I didn't realize that your clock's a lot faster than mine. So I'm going to do my best to put everything and make it complete and make it simple. And I tell you what, I went so long this morning, I even forgot to circle back to this uh, scripture reading that Dylan read for us in Acts chapter 4, which pretty much summed up everything I talked about. So don't forget to go back and reread the scripture reading. In Psalm 130, out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. I don't know where the moment of depths is for your life. Maybe you haven't hit it yet. Maybe you've been there. Maybe you've been there for a long time. I hope you never find that moment. But that moment in some people, it's obviously going through a lot of torment and pain and anger and, and just moments of depression and crying out for everything and and sometimes it's just absolutely just heart-wrenching what they go through. For others, it's a really good life. In reality, they have everything that they need. It's just now finally coming to the realization that they have committed sin in Jesus Christ. The death of their life obviously is rooted in spiritual things more so than enduring some of the physical things of this life. Whatever that moment is for you, out of the depths, wherever that is in my life, I cry to you, O Lord. In other words, I recognized you. Some of us don't recognize that when we're in the depths of our life, whatever it is we're going through, sometimes we don't cry out to the Lord. And so I'm here, he said, I cried out to you in that moment. I didn't forget about you. I knew that I needed you in that moment because I was so deep, I can't get myself out anymore. Maybe I've tried on my own time and time again, and it's just not work. But I figured it out when I was there and at my, my lowest point, I finally surrendered unto you and I yielded unto you and I cried out to whom? To my friends, to my neighbors, to my church people? Maybe. But I cried out to you, Lord, because I knew you were the one source who I could turn to, who would listen, and who would deliver me. But who does he recognize? Lord. His Savior, God, and all the above that God is, he says, to you I cried, O oh Lord, my God, my Lord. And in verse 2, Lord, hear my voice. Listen to me. It's amazing out of this that we ask God to listen to us, although He already knows us. He's just waiting for you to start talking. He already knows the moments that, that you're in distress. He's, he, he's following you everywhere you go. You can't hide from Him, right? But what he's waiting on is for you to recognize in that pit, in that moment, the depths of your life where he sees you. Are you going to call upon him? Are you going to cry out to him? And it's not to say, hey, excuse me, I, I got a question for you. No, it's where everything is just against you so much that you can't take it anymore. And you have just exhausted yourself because guess what? You can't overcome the physical things. You can't overcome the spiritual things. You have struggled with some sort of addiction in your life. You have been some way characteristically. You have no self-control over self in some capacity. And you're striving over and over again to overcome those things. And you just can't. You've asked for help from a friend. And they've helped you in every way, shape, or form. But in the grand scheme of things, you've got to change it. You've tried to alter your habits. Try to alter your way of life. And in the end, you're still struggling to overcome those things. But the one thing that we've never really reached out to in full capacity is that we completely surrender to God and say, help me. It's not saying, God, just forgive me and give me strength today to go on out in my life. It is a true surrender, fall on your knees, prostrating yourself before the throne of God and asking Him for help. But then waiting for that moment, seeing that moment and seizing that moment. He says, Lord, hear my voice. Let your ear be attentive to the voice of of my supplications, my needs, my desires, my wants, my thanksgivings, and my gratitudes. Everything that I am, that I'm lifting up to you, God, please hear it. In one way, we might feel selfish at this moment. Because God, you probably got bigger problems to deal with, right? And who am I, right? Who are you? You are God's creation. You're God's child. God loves you and cares for you. There's no one on this earth that he doesn't love or doesn't care for. Now, obviously, the response is totally different for a lot of people. But God loves you and God cares for you. And to think that you've cried out and just nobody's hearing me and nobody listens to me and nobody loves me, he does. You know, sometimes you call somebody like, I don't want to listen to them, so they don't answer the phone. 
you're talking, you're talking, and someone spaces out because they just really, really want to hear your story for the fifth time. Somebody says, oh, I'm just tired of your business. I've got my own business. We don't, I don't have time to help you. You know, God never sleeps. He's up at 3 a.m., just like you are, crying out to Him. He's on no time zone or whatever. He doesn't take collect calls. He doesn't have a phone bill that you have to worry about. You can call Him any time of the day or night, and you can talk to Him until the day that you die, and He'll never stop listening to you. Hear my voice, O Lord. Be attentive to the voice of my supplications. He says in verse 3, If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? I thought about this if statement. My wife got me the, on the way home, by the way. She listened to the lesson this morning. And she said there's an if statement in John chapter 14. Okay, now, I'm not going to go to John chapter 14 and talk about that if statement. But the if statement here it almost seems like a possibility type thing, a questionable thing. If, Lord, you should mark iniquities. But does God mark iniquities? Yes, he does, right? Because we sin, he knows it. There you go. It's not that if you do, but I know that you do. But if you do, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? Well, God does mark iniquities, and no one can stand. But well, hold on a second. In verse 4, but there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. So when God marks iniquities, in a sense, no one can stand. However, verse 4, there's forgiveness with you that you may be feared. So every time we sin against God, we mark an iniquity, right? So if you, Lord, mark iniquities, okay, who can stand? So it's the response and recognition against God that God can mark iniquities, that no one can stand before God because He's God. He's pure and He's holy, right? He's sinless. We're not. We're fallible. We fall short of His glory. But the response is this, that if and when God should mark iniquities, if God is going to mark an iniquity, okay, then there has to be, what does he say here in verse 4? Forgiveness of sins. So God declares that if there is iniquity, which there is, we've fallen in the garden, right? We sinned. What's God's response? Forgiveness through His Son, Jesus Christ. He didn't just make free will, knowing that we're going to sin and we're going to fall short of that glory and say, well, sorry, you had a chance. He said, okay, well, you did have your chance. However, from the foundation, the beginning of the world, God declared that His Son, Jesus Christ, will come to this earth and die for our sins. So again, it's not the if, but the possibility. But since God, if you're going to mark iniquities, okay, if you're going to do that, which He does, then God, who can stand? No one. However, God, what you did do, based on the fact that no one, obviously, can stand because of the iniquities, you brought forth forgiveness of sins. But notice what he says here in verse 4. That you may be feared. So, even though God marks iniquities because what people do, even unbelievers, right? Even unbelievers who sin, God marks iniquity. God brings forth salvation to them if they choose, right? Absolutely. But do those people fear God? No, they don't at all. I mean, if they did, they would recognize the marks of iniquities that they had done and the need for forgiveness. But they don't fear God. We fear God. The psalmist here is fearing God because, again, he recognized God does mark iniquities. God has brought forth salvation, made it available, and thus, therefore, fears and reverence and awe of God. The fear is two different ways. The fear is knowing that God does mark iniquities. And we should fear that. We believe in God. We believe He exists. We believe that we have sinned. We believe that He is holy. The world doesn't fear God because they don't believe there is iniquities. And they don't have no need of a Savior, right? So why fear God? They don't believe Him. But again, Christians, we fear God because we know God is holy. He does take into account of wrong suffered, obviously. Because we have sinned against Him. But that forth He made the ability of forgiveness of sins in His Son. So the fear comes in two different ways. One, you don't recognize your need of a Savior, but yet you recognize the iniquities. In other words, God, I know I've sinned against you, but I don't care and I'm going to do whatever I want. We also recognize that there is a God and that man sins, but again, I'm just not going to partake. I'm not going to change who I am. We can read all about it in our Bibles. And so what? Maybe one day I'll ask for forgiveness. There's no real course of changing who you are. That's a fear and that you're still going to be condemned guilty on the day of judgment. 
That's when you stand out in the cornfield and the storm comes along the way and you fear because you're going to die in your sins. Not stand out there and if it's time, my time, it's my time because I'm going to heaven. That's in a sense of fear we reverence and awe because we truly respect our God. And that's what he's saying here. God, you do mark with iniquities, but who can stand no one? There is forgiveness in you, but fa the fact is that even regardless, we may fear you. Because again, you are a God. But in verse 5, he says, I wait for the Lord, my soul does wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning, indeed more than the watchman for the morning. So again, based on all that he said here, right, verse 1 and following all, all the way to the 4, okay, he cries out to the Lord, he asks for God to hear my voice, he recognizes the fact is that God is going to mark iniquities, obviously who can stand, there is forgiveness in your name, and you should be feared based on all those things that he believes in. But he's also partaking of. He's going to wait, therefore, on the Lord. Now, again, you're not going to wait on the Lord if you don't ever find yourself crying out for God. If you don't recognize that God marks iniquities, in other words, that I have sinned and fallen short of his glory, you're not going to wait on the Lord. You're not going to wait on the Lord if you don't recognize that there is forgiveness and redemption of those sins and that we ought to fear God. I'm not going to wait on Him. You want to know what, I, what I'm saying is here, that you're not going to wait on the Lord because you're going to go out, eat, drink, and be merry. In other words, you're going to do whatever you want. I'm going to go wherever I want, do whatever I want, say whatever I want, live the way that I want. But he's declaring here the fact is, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits for Him. And I'm doing this in his word, do I hope? It is his word that declares who he is, but also declares his promises of what he will do for us. If you notice in his word, his word tells us that we have fallen short of that glory, right? But it's also in his word that says that Jesus Christ died for our sins, that there is eternal life within him, and we have one day will be redeemed with him. So again, I go back to this concept here. How can our soul wait for the Lord if we don't know His Word that which we ought to have hope? If the world doesn't know or anyone doesn't know His Word, how can you hope in Him? Because you don't know who He is because you haven't read His Word. And so therefore, you're not going to eagerly wait for the Lord. Your soul's not going to wait for Him in any capacity. In other words, having this redemption to finally come up out of the depths of that which he says in verse 1, he says he cries out to the Lord. He cries out to the Lord in hope because he knows that Jesus Christ is coming. And that God does love him. That God is going to redeem him. And so based on all the things that I know absolutely true, and how did I know that? He knows it specifically from his word. Now obviously you look at creation, you compare it up God as well. But he's, he's believing in the word that which God has written to him about who God is, our position, and that which God has done and will do for us. So as we continue on in this life, and we go back this morning, right? This is the day which the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. How are we going to rejoice and be glad? How are we going to have hope? It's all going to be based, again, in the, in the word of God. And the word of God declares that I love you. And that there is redemption in my son's blood. And because of those things, I'm going to wait on the Lord. My soul is at distress. That's why I'm calling about God. That's why I'm asking you for help in some capacity. But did you notice what help he's actually asking from God? What help? He's asking for financial help. Is he asking for help in relationships? In any capacity? What is he declaring here in every circumstance, in every verse? And I know it's really, really small here, but what is he saying? What he's declaring is, is my soul waits. Me. My eternal existence. Me. Waits for you. Again, all those things in life won't ever fully be gone. Financial challenges, relationship challenges, all those things. And you can do everything you can to be the best person to repair those, but you can't change somebody else. They'll always be them. The only one that you can change and safeguard is you. And so what he's crying out to the Lord is, is redeem me. I'm crying out to you. I believe in you. I have sinned against you. You mark my iniquities. I have redemption in your, in your name. 
I fear you, God. Based on all those things, I'm waiting for you. I'm not waiting for my bank account to get right. I hope it does. I'm not waiting for relationships to get better, but I hope they do. I'm not waiting for the world to change, but I hope it does. The news will always be there. Chaos, sin will always be in this world. The one thing that we have an ability to affect and change is our lives. And what we want so much more than anything in this world is to be with God in heaven. And I'm waiting for things to change. I'm waiting for things to get better. Folks, it's getting worse, and it always will. We were just talking at dinner time the other day, and I thought, and Jack, back in Genesis chapter 5, when God destroyed the world the first time by a flood, why did He do that? It was because the immorality of mankind. Now, obviously, I haven't lived the last any more than 41 years, but I don't know in any time in existence that the immorality has ever been this high other than the moment when he finally declared that he was going to destroy mankind the first time. In other words, it's getting worse. There is no control. There's no structure over anything. People have a free will to be whoever they want the way that they want. Our laws are being dictated based on those things, and they're giving people what they want. They're appeasing man tremendously more than appeasing the Word of God. And the statutes and the commandments of those things, children are rampant. They're declaring that I want to be a man or a woman regardless of the gender that they, God has given them. They're declaring that I want to live this way or that way and I want to do all my, I want regardless of what people say. They want to take control over their bodies and say, you know what, I want whether or not this child is going to live or not. They completely disregard the Word of God. Folks, it's getting worse. I remember when we had our children. Cordy and I, we were talking about it very closely. And I felt guilty bringing another child in this world. The world that's getting worse day by day by day. Because one day I won't be here and that child probably still will be. And I'll feel extremely guilty that I brought a child into this world to live in this sinful world. And it it's so amazing because I say sinful world, world, but I said this morning that when God created this day, He said it was good. And when God said this day was good today, not just on day one through six, but even on day seven and every day that's ever came and ever will come, it is good. The day is good. And if it's not in any capacity, it's because of us. And it truly is of mankind. The psalmist is declaring this very thing. God is good. God has created all these things. But the one thing that I desire so much is that my soul does wait. I'm patiently waiting. Again, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be. All I know is it's going to be a blink in an eye. I think about 41 years and what's gone by. From the, grad, from the moment that I probably remember my first memory in life to the moment that I was driving to the graduation when we got married and we had our children and so forth. All the way to this moment, I've ran marathons. I've got my gra graduation degree in high school, or not only high school, uh, bachelor's degree. And all the things that I've done, but all those things went by so far. And all of a sudden now it was 25, 20, 15, 10 years ago, whatever it is. It's just gone by so fast. To wait on the Lord and desire to be with the Lord is truly a blink of an eye. But even though as that moment is so short and very forthcoming, what is our desire in any capacity? He says in verse 6, my soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning. Indeed, more than the watchman for the morning. The watchman that is completely dark and he's watching for that morning horizon that comes upon. It's not that we watch for this the moment that it happens. We're already watching it well before it already happens. And that's his point. The watchman's been watching this for hours. He didn't just say, well, the sun comes up at 5.30, maybe we should get out there at 5.29. He's out there hours before preparing for it, getting ready for that moment because he knows it's imminent, it's going to happen. I'll bring all this to a close because I promised you I'd keep it short. Shorter. In verse 7, O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is loving kindness, and with Him is abundant redemption. And He will redeem Israel from all His iniquities. What He really does in verse 7 is He circle back to what He's already stated in the previous verses. In the end of all these things, I'm going to hope in His Word. My soul is going to wait for the Lord with a desire, an imminent desire, a prepared desire, an eager desire. And in the end, I'm going to hope in the Lord. But notice what he says here. He's talking about himself. 
innocence in the beginning of this. But what does he declare thereafter? Israel. So it's just not about himself, but he's declaring, Oh, Israel, hope in the Lord. You yourself, the nation of Israel. In other words, it's just not about me. It's about other people. It is encouraging those other people to do the same, that which he has done himself. For the Lord, as he says in verse 7, For with the Lord there is loving kindness, and with him is abundant redemption. He didn't just say, well, with there's God, there is a beautiful place. Go there. Again, he understands the fact is that God does mark iniquities and we don't deserve to be there. But God just doesn't say you're forgiven and that's it. And that's one thing I wish I could completely wrap around my mind, but also portray to you guys tonight. Is that God just doesn't say, Kevin, you're forgiven and that's it. Great, thank you. Because I don't deserve that and I can't do that. In addition to that, God says, I have forgiven you, your sins are remiss. In addition to that, here's the crown of eternal life with me in eternal heaven. And it's eternal peace. It's an abundance, something that we can't even fathom how abundantly that is. Because there's no dollar value. There's no pile of gold. There's nothing that could ever truly say, it's just like this. John tried to describe it, obviously, in the book of Revelation. He describes it as like this or like this or like this, based on what he knew as a human from an earthly standpoint. But it was beyond that. And even then, it was glorious sounding. But I know it's beyond those things. One final thought to wrap this up. As he's declaring, he's urging them. In verse 8, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. The thought that I had the other day was, in our service to God, do we do it because there is an abundance of eternal wealth? Or do we do it because we don't want to go to hell? So the place of torment, weeping and gnashing of teeth, fire, hell, and brimstone, eternal abstinence, eternal pain, darkness away from God. Or there's no more crying, there's no more pain, there's no darkness, there's only lightness there in the eternal presence of God. And some people will I have to look at my life and say, why do I serve God? Why am I obedient? Why do I strive to go through these things? One, absolutely, because I don't want to go to the place of torment. And I think that's more so for most people when it comes to realization, because I think in some way we can fathom those things, right? We can suffer, we can feel things, and we don't want to endure those things. When people talk about how they want to pass away, they, I don't want to burn, I don't want to drown, all those things, whatever it is, they want to go in their sleep because they don't want to feel some physical pain. And even that moment would be very, very sore. And obviously, we don't want to feel that for all eternity. But when you go to the most glorious place on earth that you've ever been, a place of peace where you can just relax and just let go, and you're like, you know what? Is this heaven? Because there's no more worries that you have to go through, and there's nothing that you're focusing other than God's creation, and other than God's glory at those moments. And you're like, I want to be in heaven because of that. I would declare to you that both of those cases are wrong. The reason why we ought to go and desire to be in heaven is because God's there. I want to be with Him. Again, because He's loved you so much that He wants you to be there. And He's done everything for you to get there. Just to be with Him would be absolutely amazing. And it would be more than we could ever fathom. God, I want to be with you. Because I know if I'm with you, I don't have the eternal place of torment. And I know that when I'm with you as an extra, you've already declared that Jesus said in John 14, I'll go to prepare a place for you. I'm going to build mansions. I'm going to build a glorious place. The abundance. When I think of what he says here at the end of verse 7 here. And with him is an abundant redemption. It's not about the riches. It's not about anything that they could physically have in any... Uh, you know, the, 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 the streets are like gold and, and you have all the, the stones and all the pearls and everything else is so beautiful. That's an amazing thing. But what did John dictate in the book of Revelation? He saw the throne of God. And that's where the glory was. To be with God. To desire to be with Him 
is what should drive us always. If our existence in this life is driven because we don't want to feel pain, and if our existence is driven the fact is we want all this glory and riches and, and all this stuff here now, then we'll miss the fact that we desire to be with Him for all eternity. And if our desire is to be with Him for all eternity, then in verse 5, He says, I wait for the Lord. My soul does wait, and His word do I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman for the morning, indeed more than the watchman for the morning. He doesn't wait to not experience the depths of hell. He doesn't wait so much so that he gets some form of riches in heaven. What does he say? I wait for the Lord. For him. The invitation is for anyone to give their life to Jesus Christ, to repent from any sins whatsoever. If that is for you tonight, may you come forward now as we stand and sing.